here you're ready for your dose of reality. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Dr. Quack Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Quack, and... I can't believe how god-awful this show was. Oh, my God! I'm the important one, Mr. Mayhem, and today we've got a real... turd ball for you. Oh, my God. As you can tell, he Holy really loved the show. <laughs> oh, this show was... Awful. Yeah. I'm Correct. It was awful. There were some positives into this. Some positives. We'll get into that. I heard you screaming in the other office. <laughs> and it wasn't in it wasn't in happiness. No, it wasn't. <laughs> but I thought you would slit your wrist from watching this show. Yeah. I'm still alive, so there you go. Holy cow. <laughs> As you can tell, right behind us, we are going into the Royal Rumble 1990. This took place in Orlando, Florida. There's my positive. Orlando's a nice city. And then we get Tony Schiavone <laughs> oh, and no. Jesse Ventura. And Jesse Ventura, the most entertaining part of the show, wearing Mickey Mouse ears and a rat tail for hairdo. <laughs> Yeah. Holy cow! As you can tell, Gorilla was truly missed in, in this in this uh, pay per view here. Oh my God! Tony Schiavone, you were not let go by the WWE because he doesn't like Southerners. You were let go because you suck. Yeah, I'm gonna agree with that. You were terrible, sir. But just to top it all off, at least we got the good and bad of Gene Okerlund and Sean Moody. Mm. <laughs> Six one, half dozen the other. By this time, Okerlund was not great anymore. He kind of fell in love with the mean gene gimmick, and he wasn't very good either. It, it started to go really downhill on this. Believe me, there are some positives. I'm not poo-pooing all over it, but it's coming close. Um, first match up here, the fabulous Rougeau brothers with Jimmy Hart taking on the Bushwhackers. Uh, it's hard to believe, looking back in retrospect, how over the Bushwhacker March was. I mean, the whole crowd is stomping along with this match. And I hate to say this, this is the best match on the card. <laughs> this was the best match on the card. This match, there was a long stall opening the card, so I don't know if there was problems getting people in the building, but the, it was like a 12 minute before the bell rang trying to get this match going. <laughs> well, once it did, it actually went, went it really, well. really well. Jacques Rougeau sporting the beard. You know, we support the beard yes. movement. But Jacques Rougeau... <laughs> They're all American boys. Yeah, and he looked like he looked like poor Shane Douglas is Dean Douglas. It it it, it didn't work. Uh. And the Bushwhackers went over. Um, I gave it two and a half stars. I felt like it was a solid opener for that time frame of wrestling. This was my only three star of the night, and it was three stars. Uh, the Bushwhackers did a really good job of the comedy match to get people laughing, happy, excited about being there without going overboard. We didn't have the 17 eye poke spots. <laughs> you know, we didn't have the stand there slapping each other and then turn around and do a handshake spot. It was nothing of that garbage. The comedy was decent and it felt like they kind of did the anything you can do, I can do better kind of spot because it seems like they 
you would do something, I would do something. You would do something, I would do something. So now let's flip the script and then I did something you did. So it was kind of a strange match, but it was good. Yeah. It, it was. Well, this was my only three star of the night. Three stars. You hear that, folks? Yeah. yeah. Um, we're going to move on down here. <laughs> yes, we uh, are. Can, can we go back to talking about the Rougeos <laughs> and the Bushwhackers? <laughs> no. This one here, the genius. Uh, Lanny Poffo taking on Brutus the Barber Beefcake. Oh, oh my god. Cutting and strutting. Um, oh, man, this match <laughs> felt like a, an episode of Queer Eye for the Straight Guy. These two guys tried to out-effeminate each other, and I'm saying that in the worst negative way. I'm not saying anything against the homosexual community. I'm saying these guys... We're trying to put on who's the more fruity for this match. This match was not good at all. And it had a ref bump. <laughs> yes, it did. Another often used thing. The WrestleMania 90 got rid of the two out of three falls match. They got rid of the weightlifting or the bodybuilding competition, but added another ref bump. Oof. Yeah, didn't somebody come down uh, to help out there? Well, Mr. Perfect came down there to help the genius after, but we'll we'll get into that in a few minutes. This was a double DQ. Uh, Beefcake put the genius to sleep, started cutting his hair. Perfect came down. The referee came out. Disqualified everybody, and you could see the crowd just checking their watch. I mean, there were people on the hard cam side Checking their watch, and this match was only like eight minutes long. Yeah, they wanted to be entertained, but you could tell they were not. So yeah, you could tell they were not. It was horrible. So why'd you give it? <laughs> because my one of my favorite wrestlers, Mr. Perfect, came down and was being perfect as usual. I did give it one and a half stars. If it would have been for Mr. Perfect, we're talking three quarters of a star. Yeah, this this one was not very good. I gave it a one and a half as well. I, you know, it does not get better down and, here. And, and the bad thing is this match is better than the one he's just about to start us off with next. Yeah, all I can tell you folks is this. Holy Look, there God. are good pay-per-views and there are bad pay-per-views. And yes, we've got to review them all. It's what we do. But this next one here, oh, God. Oh, why, why would you have this match? I, I, you know, I, I get it. They're trying to put it over. But Ronnie Garvin... Uh, Rugged Ronnie Garvin versus Greg the Hammer Valentine with Jimmy Hart in a submission match. Now, this match, in theory, does belong <laughs> on a pay-per-view. Yes. In theory, a submission match belongs. But this match, folks, come on. And it was all about, um, J um, sorry, Greg Valentine's leg brace there. That was the whole storyline about this, how he would flip it around and it would add more pressure to the figure four. So Rugged Ronnie Garvin put on his own, and he called it the Hammer Jammer. Or the Heartbreaker. What else do they call it in there? Ten of the well, the, Greg Valentine's was the Heartbreaker. Yeah. But, of course, we got Tony Schiavone, who doesn't know any better, and he started <laughs> calling it the Heartbreaker. <laughs> oh, that, you, did, did we mention that Tony Schiavone sucks? If we haven't said it in 30 seconds, Tony Schiavone sucks. Oh, he did at this pay-per-view. This one here, Ugh. out of all matches, this gets my two-finger salute. I'm just pointing that out there. This was one of the worst matches I have seen in a pay-per-view in a long time. And, and, and it felt like this match... Now, for those of you that don't know, they do have what are called road agents in the World Wrestling Federation, World Wrestling Entertainment. They help try and go over and smooth out and iron out some of the possible flaws that are going to happen in a match. Whoever the road agent was, I hope they were fired because there was 31 pin attempts in a submission match. I mean, I know George Steele was around that time still as an agent, right? Uh, that I'm not sure, but he usually dealt with more of the uh, tag matches. Yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, Jack Landa, he was still there. Lanza would have done Lanza. tag matches. Uh, I don't know who the road agent was. Probably Tony Gurria. Tony Gurria. That's his guess. Because Tony Gurria was sitting out there and got pushed out of the chair. So it was probably Tony Gurria. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah, this, this match went way too long. Yeah, I gave it three quarters of a star and my two-finger salute. So, well, yeah. Well, I gave this match two ratings. <laughs> the match itself, we're in agreement. Three quarters of a star. This match was horrible. But... 
I believed that these two guys did not like each other. The intensity that they brought for this god-awful steaming pile of two-finger salutes. <laughs> I at least believe they didn't like each other. So their facial, their selling, and the intensity they brought, I gave that two stars. But the match itself was only three quarters of a star. I mean, when, when you're doing nana nana boo boo at him while you're in the figure four, that that was classic. Oh, oh let's move I'm on here. Longing for the days of Miss Atlanta Lively. Oh God, no, <laughs> no. Um, that next match here, thank God, actually wasn't a match. It was a nice segment here on the Brother Love Show, having Sensational Sherry and Sapphire on there. And I will tell you this, S Sensational Sherry, you have a cut. She, and this was not one of her better ones, and it's still, she carried the show. She did. Uh, this is one, they cut, tried to do the, where they went to talk Sapphire, pulled the microphone away to build, which, kayfabe word of the day, shine, heat, pop. They're not the same thing. When you pop the crowd, you get the immediate reaction. Like Mick Foley would cheek pop and say the name of it, and everybody stand and cheer and applaud. That's a pop. Heat is what heels get to try and build up the person they're, they're facing. When a heel is getting heat, he's trying to get the baby face, the good guy, a little more support. And when the shine is what good guys or baby faces get, trying to get the crowd to like them more. Baby faces don't get heat. And you hear it, the mayhem cometh with the knowledge. He really does. So, going with this... Because this, this was really not Sherry Martell's best. It wasn't Brother Love's best. We're going to talk about uh, Sapphire here, Juanita Wright. Juanita Wright, there's not a lot of known about her outside of the wrestling world, but Juanita Wright was a trendsetter. She was the very first woman in the state of Missouri to get a referee's license. That's right. Congratulations. So, well, well nobody knows a lot about her, and she passed away in 1996, only six years after this. And she was in her 60s when she passed. But she still was the first to get a referee's license and also wrestled for a little while as Princess Dark Cloud. I could not find any matches, so I'm sure there's some out there, but I couldn't find any. She didn't do this very long. Yeah, and if I got some, they'll be right behind me. And if not, you won't see it. But the better part of this is what brought out Dusty Rose and brought out the Macho King to set up their match where they were battling over who's going to be the the holder of the crown, so while the, the women didn't put their, forth their best effort, all in all, this, this did get a two-star uh, segment from me. Yeah, it got two stars, baby, because it had polka dots out there, and it had the American Dream, baby. He was out there, five wild with kings and queens, he was going at it. Well, he had pork and beans. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure this whole pay-per-view did, man. It's bad. Yeah, it's a, it's a big turd. Yeah, moving on here. Big Boss Man with Slick, the Doctor of Style, taking on Hacksaw Jim Duggan. Uh, only because I didn't want to insult the Geico clap. This was my Geico clap of the night. I couldn't give it to Ronnie Garvin and Greg Valentine because that didn't even deserve an applause. <laughs> this match was slow, plodding. I mean, Duggan was never a great talent, but he was competent. Yeah. The boss man was never a great talent, but he was competent. And they brought in competence to this match. This was slow. There was nothing exciting. The only exciting part about this was Hacksaw went over by disqualification when boss man hit him with his nightstick, and then the two of them fighting, fighting afterwards was actually more exciting than the whole match. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, one and a half stars for mostly for what happened afterwards. Yeah, I, I gave it two stars. It, it was you know nothing great. It, it really kind of put the the crapola on top of the the poo poo platter. You trust me, that's what this whole setting the table of this pay per view definitely fit because the main event really you know I and, and I'm I'm okay with it this pay per view because the Royal Rumble I get excited on. In 1990, you know, you had 30 great competitors in this. You had 30. We had one, two, three, four, eight, nine, ten. 
17 Hall of, excuse me, 16 Hall of Famers. Yeah, that's a pretty stacked, all, all, you know, card right there when you got over half of them being Hall of Famers. Let me run that down for you. Ted DiBiase, Coco Beware, Marty Jannetty, Jake the Snake, Macho King, Randy Savage, Rowdy Rowdy Piper, the Warlord, who actually lasted more than a second in this year, Bret Hart, Bad News Brown, Dusty Rhodes, Andre the Giant, Red Rooster, Demolition Axe, Haku Smash, Hakeem, uh, Superfly Jimmy Snuka, Dina Bravo, Earthquake, Jim the Anvil, Nine Heart, The Ultimate Warrior, Rick the Model Martell, Tony Atlas, The Honky Talk Man. Oh, Tito, not Tony. Tito. Oh, Tito. Sorry, not sorry, Tony. Yep. Tito Santana, excuse me, Tony, uh, Honky Talk Man, Hulk Hogan, Shawn Michaels, Warlord, Rick Rude, Hercules, and Mr. Perfect. Well, the Barbarian, but it's okay. Yeah, well, I had the Barbarian, too. It's all right. He, he, that was a lot of reading for him. He had to hold his breath and think about it. So I'm know. telling you, man, when you go through 30 names, whew! And they, the big storyline of this one was Ted DiBiase drew number one after drawing number 30, as they tried to put over the He, he didn't buy it, did he? No, he didn't buy it. No. Vince, Vince, Vince McMahon tried to build a story and, and put Teddy over. So, but Ted lasted a long time. He was number the first person in. He was number eighteen eliminated. He was he outlasted a lot of big names. And so, my quack attack here, quack attack for the best part of this match and the best part of this show to me was seeing Demolition eliminate Andre the Giant. That takes a lot. Of a feat to be able to do, and and, and good job for uh, good job for Andre. I mean, he didn't he doesn't have the ability to go backwards over, but he went out and it looked believable. Yeah, uh, he played ball, uh, so that was definitely awesome. And watching Teddy take out Coco Beware, Marty Jannetty before there was anybody else in the ring was nice to see. You know, gave a good push, but. The other thing I noticed that was all the way up till entrant number six before we got the first fake elimination. What I mean by fake elimination is the, you know, they're they're trying but they're not really trying. Yeah. So it's all the way to number six, which was Roddy Piper was in the ring before we got our first fake elimination. And the winner of this pay, uh, Royal Rumble, Hulk Hogan, uh, eliminating Mr. Perfect by throwing him over top the the ring corner and post. I thought that was very cool. It was, um, I don't think Hogan needed this win, but I'm okay with it. Um, Hogan always needs that win, don't he? Yeah. <laughs> and, and unfortunately, Akeem didn't make it to the Final Four this time. Yes, and, and that was very sad. He did a very good job in there. I mean, overall, I gave this uh, about two and a half stars. I felt like it was a solid Royal Rumble. It's memorable for certain things, but it wasn't above and beyond. I gave it two and a half stars. Uh, the only th really, this one was nothing special. You know, you didn't have a lot coming out of this one. The only thing was the first standoff between Hogan and the Warrior that set up WrestleMania six, which they really pushed the hell out of. Yes. But you get the first standoff. You get Hogan eliminating the Warrior. He comes in, stares at him again, beats up uh, what was it, Akeem and the Boss Man, mm -hmm. and then takes off running out the crowd. You know, he. Warrior being warrior. And then they also the Bad News Brown and Roddy Piper standoff. Yeah, that, that came out of this. They were feuding out of it. They, they got ready to take it into WrestleMania for their feud. Yeah. But all in all, this one really wasn't exciting except Teddy. Ted, Teddy was my, you know, my, my, my you smell moment was this whole pay-per-view, but really it was... And and I'm, not, I'm, not even, I'm not even going to fault Greg Valentine. I'm putting all the blame on Ronnie Garvin. Yeah, put, put it on the entire pay-per-view. That's right. But the good part of this, Ted DiBiase, for a long time, for like five years, he held the record for the longest time of being in. Yeah. It was this paper, it was this Royal Rumble. So good job, Ted DiBiase. Yeah. Well, that's it, folks. That's what we got here. Get ready to check out what we start next week to our road to WrestleMania. Because it's coming, and we're going with that great pay-per-view. And also, we just started a new segment. It came out on Monday, The Cold Case. We examined Ivan Koloff to see if he deserves to be in the WWE Hall of Fame.
So check that out, and we're going to be coming out with another one in the next couple weeks. Be watching for who we to say may not belong in the Royal Rumble. Be watching for that show to be coming out. Yeah, and get ready for the big tournament as well. The champion that's on crown is already underway. Um, keep looking for updates on that. We will have individual podcasts. And remember, if you haven't been voting so far on this tournament, folks, you have a choice in saying who was the greatest wrestler never to hold the world title. So if you haven't voted, start voting. That's right. I'm Dr. Quack. And I'm the important one, Mr. Mayhem. And please watch this show. <laughs> you got to. It's the best. Uh, no, it wasn't. It was awesome. And I'm out.